Chuck Olenek, I'm a reenactor. And for 36 years, I used my weekend hobby of historical reenactment to feed my job, you know, feed my career. I would use it to lure my students in my classroom into uh, realizing how cool history was by me showing up in the garb and sometimes I would be in character the entire day and I'd do this maybe a hundred days out of the year when I was on a really good roll. And it was a gratifying way to see how the kids latched on to what I was doing and how they remembered uh, certain topics and how they were able to take a look at current events and relate them to past events. Well, I'm not in the classroom anymore. And I had to find a way to put my time to use, put my passion for bringing the past to life to use besides doing it on the weekends. And I also have a room full of garb at home that's not gonna get worn and I haven't got the heart to get rid of it. So I'm gonna put it to use this way. I'm doing videos on California history. I decided to take a really good look at the topic because oh, I live in California, duh. But there's also the thing of, I'm the kind of guy that will pass by an open field and I'll see a marker and I'll be the guy that pulls over to look at the marker and wonder what happened, you know, in that field or on that hill or mountain on that particular day in history. And I start to look at the countryside differently. Well, in exploring California history, I started with the missions and the presidios because, okay, that's a, that was a good place to start. And I got to deal with the controversy of whose side am I taking, you know, in, in presenting history. I'm taking nobody's side. I'm trying to present things as they're going along. And uh, let, you know, if there's alternate points of view, I try to present alternate points of view, just like I did in the classroom. Well, I waded through the missions and the presidios and the Spanish and the Mexican eras. I explored Russian California. I got into following banditos and outlaws and lawmen, you know, and taking a look at stage coaches and the stage lines spreading, the railways spreading through the state. And I noticed there was a major thread that went through my study of the missions and uh, some of the other aspects of California history. And that was the effect of the Mexican War. And so I decided, all right, let's focus on the Mexican War only in California. And so far I've done a video on the prelude to it because there was enough of a shoving match going on between Mexico and the United States you know, before the war. And I've dealt with the first part of the war. Now we're gonna deal with wrapping up the war and uh, John C. Fremont's march south you know, to get the Treaty of Coenga signed. And I hope you stick with me on my journey. John C. Fremont had spent November of 1846 recruiting more Californians into his battalion and gathering horses and mules at San Juan Batista, which led to the American victory at the Battle of Natividad. And on November 28th, Fremont is going to march south. And he's basically taking over a lot of towns in this part of the state pretty much without gunfire because I guess you show up with a superior force that's done so he's going to continue to move south and he'll he's going to take over the former missions of San Antonio de Padua and San Miguel and he'll move on to take over the former Asistencia now Rancho Santa Margarita capturing a uh, Chumash Indian who was carrying a message at the explicit orders of 
attacked on Pico. The Indian was put to death. Fremont threatened to arrest everybody involved here at the Asistencia, or former Asistencia, now Rancho, and he would do this unless they swore loyalty, which they did. He then moved on. When he gets to San Luis Obispo, what he ends up doing is he arrests Don Pico, who was in charge here and who had sent the message, arrested him for treason, and he put him on trial, and he was found guilty. Pico was going to be executed, but after a few days, Fremont changed his mind. After the excitement of what happened in San Luis Obispo with putting Don Pico on trial and thinking about executing him and then letting him go, Fremont and the California Battalion continued south down El Camino Real. And they would have, if they'd followed their original course, gone past or right in between the missions of La Purisima and Santa Inez, and they would have gone into Gaviota Pass and whipped around to Santa Barbara, where there was a presidio, you know, as well as a fairly major pueblo. And they hoped to engage the California forces there. But about a day's march away from San Luis Obispo is Rancho Nipomo along the Camino Real. And uh, over here, this is the Dana Adobe. Okay, captain Dana, former sea captain, he owned this. And so Fremont on the California, or the California volunteers, they camped out around here. And in talking, Fremont was told, there's an ambush lying in wait for you. The California forces from Santa Barbara are in Gaviota Pass waiting for you. So now Fremont is going to end up changing direction. And what he's going to do is instead, he's going to go over the San Marcos Cuesta and take that pass and he's going to drop down into Santa Barbara. It really would have been better for Fremont to have taken his troops through Gaviota Pass. It was more level, even though it was a narrow pass, but it was also a well-used route. You know, it was the Camino Real. But the information that was given to Fremont forced him to change his plans. And a man named Foxen and his son William they instead moved Fremont through the or up the San Marcos uh, Cuesta or the grade and they went through the San Marcos Pass and they're doing this on Christmas Eve 1846 and there is a terrible storm it's really rainy and what is happening is going up the grade and down the grade Fremont is losing horses and mules and cannon which are slipping in the mud and going down the hillsides but eventually what will end up happening is they will drop down the other side of the San Marcos Pass and they will drop into a largely deserted Santa Barbara by the way they don't turns out they don't have to really worry about the troops attacking them you know, coming in from the north. What, because what ended up happening is those California troops ended up going to Los Angeles. They apparently weren't in the pass after all, but that's what Foxen had heard. So that's what he told Fremont. So, okay, so now Fremont basically raises the flag here. Santa Barbara is taken over. Um, the Presidio, by the way, which was the old fort, it ceased to have a military function years ago. So it's kind of an empty gesture. And Fremont sets up a base in um, uh, like a hotel. Well, now 
there is a person who is essentially mom. She's the matriarch in uh, the Santa Barbara, or at least that's the way people view her. Um, Doña Bernarda Ruiz de Rodriguez. And she asked for like a 10 minute audience with Fremont. Well, the 10 minutes turns into like two hours. And <clears throat> in that time, she is convincing Fremont that certain conditions are going to need to be met in order to achieve a victory that's going to cost fewer lives and it'll be easier for everyone to get along. And uh, she wanted, I mean, like, the, ideally the release of uh, Andres Pico, who is in charge of the California forces. And that there would be a treaty signed that would basically be respected by both the Americans and the Californios. Um, and there was basically a lot of, let's just get along, let's just get through this. And Fremont says he's going to consider this. And when he and his California battalion leave, Santa Barbara, Doña Bernarda is coming along for the ride because she's going to help negotiate the end of uh, California's part in the war uh, between the United States and Mexico. While Fremont was recovering in Santa Barbara from his march through the San Marcos Cuesta, the only battle in Northern California was taking place at Santa Clara. On January 2nd, 1847, there was an altercation between Californios and American forces. Battle of Santa Clara, nicknamed the Battle of the Mustard Stalks, took place about two and a half miles west of Mission Santa Clara de Assis, basically next door to the Pueblo of San Jose. Californios were angry at American immigrants settling on their ranchos. Six men of the U.S. Sloop Warren, who had gone ashore to buy cattle from Mexicans for food, were taken hostage by a group under Francisco Sanchez, who had 200 men. U.S. volunteers at Santa Clara and San Jose were sent to free them. The Americans were in a mustard field in a dry creek when the Mexicans opened fire. Once the Americans reached open ground, the fighting turned their way. An armistice was agreed to after two hours by which time four Mexicans were killed with four Mexicans and two Americans wounded. By January 7th of 1847, there was a treaty signed between the Americans and the Californios stating that American forces would respect the rights of the Californios and not seize their property any longer. So now we turn our attentions back to Fremont, who's going to continue his march. The next stop for Fremont and the California Battalion is over at Mission San Buenaventura. And there they ran into about 70 Californios, but the superior forces of the California Battalion, 425 or 430 men, ended up chasing them off. And then they proceeded towards Los Angeles. But the thing is, they're not going to go the way a lot of people would think right now, which would be following the course of the 101, whichever one says, hey, that's the Camino Real. At that time, what they would be doing is they would be hanging a left at the Santa Clara River and following that along. And there was a spot where the expedition rested. Uh, there was a sycamore tree that was about four miles outside of Santa Paula. It's still there today. Uh, it was a place of rest. It was a uh, polling place, uh, an open air courthouse, uh, was designated a California landmark. Well, the tree is there or the remnants of it, uh, landmark plaques gone. Okay, so now Fremont's gonna continue on and he's going to start hitting the ranchos that used to be part of 
Rancho uh, San Francisco. Oh, and I'm sure that this was, uh, this pretty much looked like a circus with Fremont and his expedition going through because there were the horses, there were the mules, there were the cannons and all this, and they're now going through those hills in the Santa Clarita area. On January 8th, John C. Fremont had arrived at Mission, or actually the former Mission of San Fernando Rey de España. See, at this point, it wasn't a mission anymore, and the property had been leased to Andres Pico, who was the brother of the governor, Pio Pico, and this was leased to him as his summer home. So to have an American occupying force showing up at his home had to be really depressing. Well, Pico is going to hear more depressing news. On January 8th, 1847, 11 miles east of the Pueblo de Los Angeles and nine miles south of Mission San Gabriel, that the forces of that same Captain Stockton and supported with forces uh, by, commanded by Brigadier General Kearney, defeated the last of the California forces. The day after the Battle of Rio San Gabriel, there was a last gasp by California forces in what is now present-day Vernon, the Battle of La Mesa, which also turned into a defeat for the California forces. January 10th, the city of Los Angeles was taken over again by American forces led by General Kearney and Stockton. And now it's starting to look hopeless for the Mexican forces in California. So what will end up happening is Doña Bernarda, who accompanied Fremont from Santa Barbara, she's going to go travel on the 12th to meet with Pico and negotiations for peace are going to, or a treaty, are beginning. On January 13th, Fremont, along with Doña Bernarda looking on, met with the Mexican forces and they signed the Articles of Capitulation, which got rephrased later as the Treaty of Coenga, surrendering California to the American forces. Okay, so we've wrapped up the Mexican War now California is part of the United States, 31st state. Now I'm going to find other parts of California history to take a look at. I hope you stick with me on my journey.